somehow I skipped over it when I got got ready to do the class and uh, I had it all prepared and I did 42 and then 43. <clears throat> However, this one sort of uh, dovetails into the last class that we had, so we'll, we'll do Psalm 40. Um, just to begin with, we're only going to read the first eight verses. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a, notice the wording, a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And thy thoughts, which are toward us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ear hast thou opened. <clears throat> Burn offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. <clears throat> All right. Um, many of you may notice that <clears throat> there's quite a few of these verses that are quoted in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And they are quoted as if Jesus quoted these <clears throat> during his earthly ministry. It says, the way that it's quoted there is, and when, when Jesus, when the Lord came into the world, this is what he said. <clears throat> so it's interesting because we have no quote of this in the Gospels. But the New Testament writers apparently didn't just go by the Gospels and, in fact, went by the Old Testament to see, I'm going to say it like this, went by the Old Testament to see the New. They went by the Old and there they saw Jesus. <clears throat> so here we're, we're reading about waiting patiently and the Lord inclined to me and he brought me out of a horrible pit and out of miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. <clears throat> when we read this psalm or any other psalm, or any other portion of scripture, when we read it, we either identify with ourselves and our personal situation, or we see Jesus there and we identify with him. Ultimately, we identify with him <clears throat> as those who are not just Christians, but those who are one. Those who are one. And this is a challenge because many of the teachers and preachers and whatever regularly put it out there in the sense of just applying this to yourself when in fact, and, and listen carefully, this is applied to you in Christ or in union with Christ, but it is never just applied to you in the sense of it, it only refers to you and it's something to help you out of your situation. So uh, consider verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. <clears throat> so here the, the writer of this, who this is a quote from Jesus. So it is Jesus talking here. <clears throat> the writer of this is saying this horrible pit, this miry clay was what Jesus went through. It was the sufferings he went through. It was the cross that he went through. It was all in relationship to the life of Christ. And that's why he said, he stops in the middle of that and quotes Jesus saying, Behold, in the volume of this psalm, it's written of me. In the volume of all the psalms, it's written of me. In the volume of the book, it refers to me. Let's keep your place here, but let's go over to the book of Acts and let me give you an example 
over there. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and let's start with verse verse 26. Acts 8, 26, And an angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose, and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Okay, this is imperative that we understand, if nothing else, that we understand that the apostles and the early believers looked at the Bible as declaring Christ, not just a history of the Jews, not just information to sort out your life, but to change your life, which is Christ, and therefore all these things apply to you. Therefore, when he says these words, do you understand what you read? Do you understand the Bible? We we will see that he is coming strictly on the basis, and and this will be brought out, strictly on the basis that whatever you're reading there, do you understand it? Because the true understanding of it is that does not pertain to you. That pertains to Christ and therefore pertains to you because you are in him. You are his branches. You are his hands. You are joined with him. What applies to Jesus applies to you by virtue of oneness. You see, instead of being a bunch of individuals, we are one body. <clears throat> and so, uh, he, he makes, he immediately has to make that statement because he's a New Testament believer. He immediately has to make that statement because he assumes that he may have been taught by the Jews. Because he's coming from Jerusalem and the Jews just teach its history or its prophetic prophecy or it's something else instead of being Christ-centered. Jesus himself before the New Testament was written said behold in the volume of the book it is written to me. He was talking about the Old Testament and of course uh, he's reading the Old Testament here. All right. In verse 31 and he said how can I, this is the Ethiopian speaking, and how can I except some man should guide me and he besought Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment or justice was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other? It gets sharper. The question says, is this, who is this talking about? Is he talking about himself? Is David in Psalm 40 talking about himself when the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that he wasn't talking about himself, that, he was, that it's talking about Jesus? And it's a direct quote of Jesus and taken as if Jesus said it during his ministry and walk on the earth. So he asks a good question here. Of whom does this speak? Then in verse 35, then, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
Do you see that? He didn't preach, God will help you the way that, that God helped this man, or God will help you the way, uh, the way God helped the man in Psalm 40, God will help you. He said, those are referring to Christ. That speaks of Christ. In the volume of the book, it is written of him. Um, of whom speaks this? Of himself or someone else? And he said, it's someone else, and I'll tell you who it speaks of. It speaks of Christ. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> the way I'm going to get through this is just to read my notes, because when I talk, we never get anywhere. <clears throat> if we see ourselves then, uh, if we see ourselves then, and we're, we're looking at ourselves and we're seeing ourselves in that scripture or in Psalm 40, then the horrible pit is not the cross, but it is our own trials and tribulations. Am I right or wrong? If we see ourselves, then all we're going to see there is our own trials and tribulations. But if we see the cross, then we see something different. <clears throat> and therefore I wrote, then if we, see, we don't see the cross and we see our own trials and tribulations, then when we seek out help from God over, over our circumstances, we will seek a different remedy than we would if we saw Christ crucified. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Because if you see Christ and him crucified and you are identified with him, folks, there is a clear cut, clear route that you will take. That's exactly right. But if you don't, if you don't, if you see yourself, then you'll take a road and it won't necessarily be wrong. It just won't be Christ. I'm, I'm saying that because this isn't a situation of right or wrong. This is a situation of, well, we'll, we'll spell it out here in a minute. But it's a, it's a situation of identification in Christ or still identifying in ourself. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> yeah, and the spirit being the spirit of Christ, the spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> yes. And if our circumstances are taken in such a manner that Christ crucified is excluded. Now, now, first of all, should we ever take any circumstance in life where Jesus is not included in some manner in that? Okay. Well, for us, the inclusion is oneness. For us... We are included only because we're one with him. Only because what happens to the vine happens to the branch. Okay? So if our circumstances are taken in such a manner that Christ crucified is excluded, but we are taking those as if we are what? Victims. If we take them as if we are victims, then we seek a civil court hearing and we want justice. Is that wrong? Not necessarily. We already went over that. Not necessarily. But the question is, are you identified in Christ or with him? In him is being a branch, an extension of him. With him is, he's God and judge and everything else, and he'll, he's set up these things for you. But it, but it depends on how, how you are identified. But if we see it as Christ crucified, then we will understand why he opened not his mouth. It is his way of bringing people in, meaning not just the fact of op not opening his mouth, but going through that whole trial, he went through that so that you and I might be saved. It wasn't just maltreatment of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Jesus was not murdered. Jesus was a sacrifice. He gave himself. Okay? That's a whole different picture. It's just a whole different picture. <clears throat> we will understand Acts 29 through 35, which, which we read. Then this... Um, 
or, or verse 32, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. Okay. I, I just, I, I have probably been to court more than all of you put together in this room. Okay. No, don't doubt it. Uh, I have two felonies on my record, okay? So, I am telling you that if you go to court, you are not wise if they put you on the stand not to open your mouth. But Jesus didn't open his mouth. Right? Look at, look at verse 33. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. In him humbling himself, his justice was taken away. Why? Come on, why? Because this was not a civil court to him. This was an altar. Am I right or wrong, folks? Jesus came. He says, for this cause, you know, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I to this hour. I'm here for this purpose. I live for this purpose. When he set his face as a flint toward Jerusalem, that meant, he said, I'm going to die. No, nothing else really matters right now because I have healed people and they're still not changed on the inside. I have blessed people and they are still no different. I have helped people, I have fed people, I've done all these things and there's only, can, can anybody agree with me that with Jesus when he's saying there's only one solution that's gonna work and that's the cross. There's only one solution. Yes, he did say, now is my soul troubled. But he also said, and what shall I say then? And this says, he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. You know. Man. So, um, let's see. We will understand... Uh, especially verse 3, as a sacrifice, his justice is taken away while as a victim, God gives us our justice. Now, this is important to see. If you are a living sacrifice, if you are given, which, you know, if you are a sacrifice, then your justice is taken away. You never make it to civil court. You make it to, uh, maybe you're not familiar with this term, you make it to what's called in Texas a kangaroo court. Anybody know what that is? That is, they, they just hornswoggle you all the way through. You get no justice. They, you are dragged through their system and you are condemned based on anything they say regardless of of the circumstances or the proof or the evidence, or the evidence. That's, that was the word I was looking for <clears throat> and so um, however if you are a victim if you are a victim God has provided judges God has provided civil court are you with me? Yeah. if you are a victim it all depends on where you're identified, though. Remember that. If you're identified in Christ, you're going to be a sacrifice. If you're identified in yourself, you're going to be yourself. And therefore, this stuff is maltreatment. Everything Jesus went through could have been just considered maltreatment. Okay, so you have to, you have to keep these. There has to be clarity because if there's not, then we still, even if we think we've got something, we don't, we don't have it. Everything doesn't come down to what's right or wrong. 
It all comes down to what's Christ and what's not Christ. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So, um, as speaking of Jesus, as one who is totally given to God's purposes in all things. Okay, so now we need to settle something here. Jesus was a burnt offering. Okay, what that means is he fulfilled the burnt offering, which was not for sin. I'm not going to get into all this. You've heard me teach on this before. But what that means is he is totally, constantly given for God. That burnt offering burned in all day long and all through the night and all the next day. They would keep it going, okay? Jesus was totally, completely given to what the Father wanted. All right? That's Jesus. You're not going to... <laughs> That's just Jesus, okay? You'll never find him off doodling off over here on something. Jesus is going to be that way. All right. Now, we are one with Jesus, and we need to let this mind be in us. Which what? What is letting the mind be in you? Become great overcome? No, who thought it not something to be grasped after to be equal with God, but humble himself and became a servant and became a man and then became obedient unto death. <clears throat> but if we let the mind of Christ, if we let the divine nature of Christ be in us, guess who's going to come out of us? Jesus. Jesus is. And guess how he's going to come out of us? He's going to be absolutely, totally given to the Father. <laughs> and there's no question about it. You know, Jesus at 12 years old, his parents who are godly Jews, godly Jews, lose him and go looking for him. They find him in the temple. And she goes, oh, we were looking for you everywhere. We were so worried. We were concerned. You, if you want to know where Jesus is, he's going to be about the Father's business. And he said that. He said, didn't you know? That if you're going to hunt for me, hunt for the Father's business, because that's where I'm going to be. Okay, that's Jesus. That's, instead of preaching consecration, we need to preach Christ. Because if Christ is our life, we will be more consecrated than we can ever be by being pumped up and talked into consecration. Am I right or wrong? Okay, is that not true in the scriptures forget me being right or wrong is that not the truth of the scriptures that Christ was meant to be and the interesting thing here is that Psalm 40 gets in the whole thing that it's quoting is this I'm not going to go into it right now and I may some other time I may next time when I come back from Arizona but He's given the specific method, the very things that we read there in Psalm 40, the specific method of how he's going to carry out the new covenant, how he's going to get rid of the old and introduce the new. Lord willing, I'll get a chance to share it with you because it's just undeniable. Okay. So, folks, this is the plan. <laughs> this is the plan. Christ in you is the plan. Christ's life is the plan. Yes. In Christ, in this living he was, he said, you're the body of the lamb, you're the flesh and bones of the sacrifice. Christ is like, whatever, but the lamb, being the body of the lamb, makes sense to go to the altar. Right. And the body of the lamb makes sense to do that. Okay, so let me read this again. As, yes. I would also say that we are as sheep to the slaughter every day. I mean, it's what it says in the word, isn't it? <laughs> every day. We are to be as sheep going to the slaughter. Let me ask you a question. Are you going to go by the word? Because you sound like one that is. That's the word of God. That ends the argument. Oh, no, it doesn't either because we have minds. That likes to argue. <laughs> But that's the word of God. It that's is. the new covenant. That's the purpose of the cross. That's the purpose of the resurrection. That's the purpose for the incarnation. It's undeniable. All right, so let me read this because I'm, I'm not even out of the second paragraph here. Speaking of Jesus, as one who is totally given to God's purposes in all things, 
Jesus suffers, the just for the unjust, but God saves us from affliction even when we deserve what we get or should get. Do you understand what I just said? That Jesus suffers for the unjust when he's totally just. But when we are in affliction as the people of God, when we deserve getting into trouble, he, he gets us out. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> but remember, it all depends on where you're identified, too. It is simply a matter of where we identify in ourselves or in him, in the cross or in the earth. Therefore, we may conclude that judges are established for and I've got to capitalize every letter of it. His people. Can I get an amen? Judges are established for his people so that they get fair treatment. This is God's provision for his people in the sheep of his pasture. Amen. As God and creator, he is just and righteous. As God, as creator, he is just and righteous. However, Jesus and all who will be one with him get no fair trial and no justice while in this earth. As long as he walks as lamb, he will be despised and rejected of men. The only place he's not despised and rejected of men is in the risen position, not on this earth. If he still walks on in this earth in you, he's going to be despised and rejected of men. Okay? Um, when people wanted to make him king, then he was popular. Remember? But he would always bring the disciples' understanding back to the cross. He did it every time. Every time they tried to make him king. Every time they tried to lift him up, he would call his disciples aside and say, Look, don't get confused. Okay, here's what the deal is. There were, there were never any fair trials for Jesus and not even fair judgments for him. And when I say fair judgments, I mean the, wherever he walked, wherever he taught, whatever he did, he was constantly being judged. I mean, even remember when he's in the house of one of the Pharisees and the ju he's judging him, saying stuff, and Jesus knows his thoughts and says, you know, you're thinking this and you're thinking this and why think he this and da-da-da-da. He's always doing that because, because, now, now see, he's not upset about that because he came to be a sacrifice. We are upset about it. We need to get out of one realm and get into the other. We need to get out of the realm of the Lamb if that's not where we're at. Okay? All right, consider, well, let's turn there. Consider Exodus 18. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 18, if you would, please. Man, I just hope we get through some of this. Exodus 18, and let's uh, start at verse 19. Let's see, I'm probably skipping uh, a bunch of stuff on this. Uh, yeah, let's look at verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. Notice what's happening here. He's sitting as a judge. You with me? He sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. All right? From the morning to the evening. Now, let me, let's read verse 19. And then his father-in-law comes and says, Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. He's saying, be as a judge for the people to God. Make your first concern the, the injustices of the people. Is that what he's saying? Okay. To God. To God. All right. Um, 
that thou may bring the causes unto God. Okay? Uh, then verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place over, such, uh, over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifty and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden of thee. So this is uh, his father-in-law, and he's came up with this great plan. Now, everybody would go, man, this is ingenious. This is a, this is a great plan, you know? And it sounds a little bit like the plan my wife gave me when we first got married. She says, look, here's what we'll do. When we get into, when we, once we get married, here's what we'll do. You'll handle all the big, big causes and problems, and I'll handle all the little ones, and I'll make all the decisions over the little things, okay? So after like about two years, I said, well, when are we going to have any big things? And she said, well, when they come up, I'll let you know. <laughs> Just kidding. She never said that. <clears throat> all right. Um, upon first leaving Egypt and barely in the wilderness, folks, barely in, we're not talking about barely in the land, we're talking about barely in the wilderness, Moses' time was taken up from morning to evening with civil issues. That is a lot of issues between people. Okay? Moses labored constantly for the people. What a good man. So that this congregation would be orchestrated in a godly and fair manner. However, he soon became overwhelmed by the issues and needs of the people. Jethro, that's his, his father-in-law. I always picture the Beverly Hillbillies Jethro going, <laughs> going well, what we ought to do here? <laughs> <laughs> Suggest setting up, get ready, a lot of judges. A lot of, what we need is a lot of judges, okay? Because there were so many issues between people that needed to be ironed out. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah. Good response, sister. This was not God's institution, but a father-in-law that, by the way, was probably a pagan because his daughter was not Jewish. Okay? Yeah. It's probably a pagan. When God set up something, it was what? When God finally started setting up stuff, it was a priesthood, and it was a tabernacle, and it was sacrifices. And we know God set that stuff up. Okay? God did not want all of Israel to become a kingdom of judges, but a kingdom of priests. A priest gives up his rights to a portion of the land. When they went into the land, they said, you get no portion in this land. And we're talking about the priests are folks, Levites and priests. That, that, that's across the board. That's, they're all priests. They're all Levites. It's the Levitical priesthood. So if you hear Levite or priest, it's all the same thing. They gave up their portion in the land. All right? Why? Why? The Lord was their portion. Okay? Um, a priest gives up his own interests and completely lives moment by moment unto God. His whole life became involved in an area where he may have had no interest previously, that of sacrifice. Now, come on. Think of, think of the altar. Think of the blood. Think of killing everything. Was that, is that something you just go, oh, you know, I think I like that job. God would have to do something in you to bring that about. Um, his, um, when two of Aaron's sons were killed by offering strange fire, he was given no recourse or no hearing before God. He was simply told not to weep publicly or show any sadness. And you can read that in Leviticus 10, 1 through 7. And it's even more strong than what I just said there. His two oldest sons died by offering strange fire. And God said to him, I don't want you mourning. I want you to stand with me. I want you to stand in my place. I don't want you, you know, you read it. Leviticus 10, 1 through 7. It's, it's a pretty powerful thing. <clears throat> All right. So a, ju a judge serves the people's interest. But a priest 
is God's own. It's his firstborn. You can read that in Numbers 3.45. He said, the, the priests, the Levites, they are mine. They, I, the firstborn that should have survived in Egypt, that was saved in Egypt. Because, folks, we always think that the Passover saved everybody. But the Passover only saved the firstborn. Everybody wasn't in danger. The death angel wasn't going to kill everybody when it, unless you had blood on your door. <laughs> it was going to kill the firstborn. And God said to the priests and the Levites, you, because they didn't, the firstborn never acted like my firstborn, you will be my firstborn. You are mine. You are separated unto me. Life is and death, death and resurrection has been the signet of who you are. Meaning what happened at, at the Passover. <clears throat> so, they, the priests were a shadow of how Christ the firstborn is to the Father. And I, I can prove that for nine straight chapters in the book of Hebrews. And almost every verse I can prove that. I'm not going to, but I can tell you that I can prove that. Uh, God showed it to me. It is just as clear and as unarguable as you can imagine. Jesus, so they're, they're, the priests are all a shadow of the firstborn. Jesus foregoes every comfort and personal concern to bring satisfaction to the Father. Is, okay, so here's the, here's the picture in the wilderness. Israel lived in camps, and each had their own standard where they camped and to which they would, could gather. Remember, they were divided up in there, and, the, and each camp, had a, had a banner, had a standard, and on that standard it represented some picture that was identification of them. Am I right or wrong? Each one of them did. All right? And they all could gather to that. They were given the privilege to gather to that. They were given an identity different from this tribe or this group or this group. They had that. They had that standard. Uh, it was their point of identification, but the priests had no standard, no rallying point that set them up as special. And then the Lord showed me their standard was the Shekinah glory. It was taller than everybody else's. <laughs> that was their standard that they gathered to because uh, uh, they also camped around the tabernacle. God said, this is, where, this is your identity, my house. This is where you camp. This is who you are. This is your identity. You are a priest. You are my firstborn. You are separated unto me. This is what you're about. You, I'm not going to give you a little standard, little banner with a little cute little picture that you can go, that's us, that's us, you know, you know. Who is of the clan of, you know, ah, you know, Braveheart again, you know. You know well, who is of the clan of God? And the Shekinah glory goes, Wah. I go, there's our standard. But it's the, we're identified in the Lord, not that that's given anything special to a priest. <clears throat> All right. So they gathered to it and not to their own particular identity. The people of God seemed to have one standard while the priest had another. Do you understand what I'm saying? They had different standards. Sure, because you know what? They didn't understand all of that. They didn't. And that's why they wanted priests in between. And God put priests in between because the... <clears throat> right. All right, but the... Peer, all right, let's see. Uh, was the institution of judges by Jethro to Moses going to be the general method by which Israel lived? God did give Israel a period of time when the concept of judges was the preeminent thing. What's it called? Book of Judges. <laughs> there we see what? Selfishness, conflict over issues. Over issues. This is the judges. Division between tribes. We need judges. Murmuring in a time period identified by ups and downs with little glory to God. This is when the judges reign supreme. Okay? <clears throat> the, uh, the, the period of the judges in no way stood as a glorious picture of what God had in mind. Right? But the period of the judges was replaced by what? 
the kingdom period. And the height of that period was ruled by King David, a man after God's own heart. And I'll show you that one. Look in Acts uh, chapter 13, and some of you who've heard my sharing recently on the habitation of God know that this scripture is also one of them that just the Holy Spirit didn't open my eyes to something there. He just dealt with my heart in a way that I cannot explain. But he showed me David, and he showed me God's love for David and why and how and the spirit of that whole thing. So that's, that's why I'm referring to it. Acts 13, 22. Let's see, I'm on the wrong page here. <clears throat> and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave, God gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, that's usually where we stop right there but it says who shall fulfill all my will and folks this means two things david was a man that was like a priest he carried an ephod he 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 he, he consulted urim and thummim these are all priestly things he went and ate the showbread come on people either god accepted him as a priest or he should have killed him all right but he was more a priest than the priests. He was more a priest than Eli. He was more a priest than the sons of Eli. He was more a priest than the sons of Samuel. Why? Because not just that he was a man after God's own heart, but who shall fulfill all my will. He was totally given to God and what he wanted in the way that he wanted it above his own, which separated him really from Judah in the sense of the tribe with the banner. God was his banner. All right. So uh, <clears throat> the word kingdom represents government. That's important to understand. And David represents those ruled by the heart of God, the government of Christ within. There can be an outward government or an inward government. Okay. A, uh, uh, I, I saw a long time ago a movie called The Mysterious Island of Dr. Moreau. And on there he took animals and mixed them with, you know, tried to make them into people and to bring them forward. And he had these, he made them his children. And one of them was like a dog. But he was human and they sat at the table and they ate and they put bibs on, they did everything proper and everything. And one of them was a daughter, and she was like a cat. And the, the son that, you know, was the dog, he always, you could tell, he always wanted to go after that and just tear it up, that cat, because that was what his true nature was. It was controlled. The law had controlled it. The judges had controlled it. But in the end, my God, you, you know, you don't want to see the most modern version of it because it'll shake you to your bones when you realize it is man's attempt to, to, to purify us without it being Christ. And you will, so what is your kingdom? What is your government? What is your inner government? That's what we're talking about, okay? And David represented the government of Christ in you. He represented a heart after God. All right, so um, I think I'm doing pretty good here. I might actually make this. <clears throat> uh, those who are one with Christ are, first of all, Godward, meaning burnt offerings. And I say that because I, I can't explain again. I have in many other classes, but the sin offering is not going to be in eternity. But the burnt offering will be continuous because it represents Christ in his self-giving nature. But not just self-giving for men, totally given to God. And in, in, he will fulfill all my will, all that I was wanting. Okay. Oh, and then that scripture that, that we quoted out of Psalm 40, you know, sacrifice and offerings, thou wouldest not, it's quoted in, in uh, uh, Hebrews 10 when it says, 
sacrifice and offerings thou hadst no pleasure in. Okay, that's clarifying for us that, he, that David shall do all his will, shall please him in the manner that he wants, not just, oh, I don't like that. But it comes to pleasing the heart of God or not pleasing it. Okay? All right, so... Um, Those who are governed by the Lamb on the throne will view all scripture and all material, uh, all outward circumstances from the view of, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. Now, we're, we're going to get into a scripture that will prove this. But somehow we have, we have believed wrongly. We have believed that that scripture is just one among many scriptures and that we can, we can focus on that for a while and be given and be dead and let Christ live in us. But if we find another scripture that talks about something else, we can void out that scripture. Let me say this. Let me put it this way. The cross is always the central object in the plan of God. God never leaves that, and Jesus never leaves it, and it'll never be something that, that you, you skip around and you find another subject over here. No, sir. This will be the application in all other subjects. You, there's, there is no, folks, there is no point from Calvary 2,000 years ago, there is no point where you are uncrucified. That's just ridiculous. Like, like Abigail would say, that's crazy talk. And she's four. That's crazy talk. There is no point. There is no circumstance where the cross is no longer valid. Amen. There is no situation where God um, honors what he crucified and put away. I'm, I'm just telling you the Father's view of this. The Father's not going to go back on the cross. Why would you? Why would I? Whatever truths we find in relation, they must be in relationship to it. And I squished my chalk in here. But if there's a one over here and there's a, uh, if there's another little subject over here and there's a package here and there's here, Whatever truths there are after resurrection and, and after A.D., after death, we claim to live in, you know, A.D., but that death still applies and that resurrection. We are the death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, Christ lives in me. He is the resurrection and the life. Right. I no longer live. And so, so that truth must be applied to any subject that we come to. You don't just jump off the cross and run to a subject. You, you are, well, in truth, you are dead at the cross, and now Christ lives in you, and every truth that comes out of you must bear the image of the crucified one. All right. Though the people of God, and notice, notice I'm using the term people of God. Though the people of God in the wilderness carried on many activities, at what point did the priests leave sacrifices, leave life in the tabernacle, or leave total focus on what pleased the Lord and not themselves? That's, that's basically saying what we just said about us here. I'm just reiterating that now. If the priests of the Old Covenant were sitting here, I would say to them, at what point, you see what I mean, if I was a preacher at that time, if I preached, I would say, at what point, priests, do you leave sacrifice? At what point do you leave the tabernacle of God, the house where you're that house? You, you see what I'm saying? You say, Randy, no, you'd be different. I wouldn't be any different. I'd preach to them the way I preach to you. 
at, at, at what point do we lose total focus on what pleases God and start pleasing ourselves? All right. That shouldn't offend a priest. But folks, I'm here to tell you, if you're not a priest and it's ju we're just one of God's people, God will vindicate us. God will avenge us. God will put us in civil court and fight for us. But we're not supposed to live just as that. And, and what I want to do in the next class is uh, I want to show completely without any shadow of doubt touching so many areas on a line of scriptures that just goes down that it is clear cut that we will, we will, we will have to deny the scriptures. Now, we've had people leave here that did deny the scriptures. You say, okay, it's not about the lamb, then. It's just the word of God says you should, you should go the extra mile. You should forgive. You should turn the other cheek. Don't do it because of the lamb. And they still were willing to go against God in his scriptures. Okay? I want to do it just simply based on the scriptures. And I want, I want the scriptures to speak, not Randy. I want the scriptures, if they are true, and this is true, they must be undeniable. They must have such clarity on all these separate points that we cannot do anything but either go fall down on our knees and say, that's the word of God. Or, if it's not true, then that's another thing. If it's not true, you just go, ha ha, you didn't make no point at all. But I believe the Lord has given it to me to, to do that. All right, so final statements here. <clears throat> Provision was made for the people of God by get, giving them judges. And I want to just, I guess I want to make that clear. That is not a problem in a certain sense. Being one of God's people, there are many scriptures that speak of us being his people. But I do want to make clear. Like, like when it calls you a peculiar people, that was only referred to as the, to the priests. <laughs> so you can't, you know what I mean? You, you got to stick with the right flow of what it's saying. Provision was made for the people by giving them judges. Provision was made for God by giving him priests. And provision was made for the priests to carry out their duties properly by giving them sacrifice. All right. Let's break and we'll come back for the next round. Ding!